Good morning and welcome to Community Bible Church. It is certainly a delight to see you here. And it is good for me to be back. I want to start by just saying thank you to uh, Tom Foreman for teaching Adult Bible Fellowship and for preaching last week. And thank all of you for being here and serving um, and supporting them. And thank you to the Divine Family for uh, ministering and leading the music last week as well. Well, let me begin by making a couple of announcements. First of all, this week on Wednesday evening, both at 7 o'clock, we have ladies' summer Bible study at our home, at the Tollison's home, and men's prayer time here at the church, both of those at 7 p.m. Then next Wednesday, so August the 31st, uh, Awana leaders and workers, please plan to meet at my house once again at 7 p.m. That's the Wednesday before Awana begins. We need to all kind of get on the same t page, do some reviewing and preparation and planning for uh, the beginning of our Awana year. So please plan to be there for that, all Awana workers and leaders. Also, uh, for that meeting, please bring a snack or a sweet to share for that evening. Uh, there are a number of things that are going to be starting back up in September. Of course, Awana will start the first Wednesday after Labor Day. Then there's Young at Heart, Ladies Bible Study, Men's Bible Study. More details really to follow in uh, the coming uh, weeks and bulletins. Also, starting the first Sunday of September, we're going to resume passing the offering plate to receive offering. You will still be able to give online. You can still mail in your donations if you choose to do so. Um, but we will probably stop making that constant announcement. Once we start passing the plate, you just know in advance. You can go to the website and give if you want to, but you can also give in the offering if you would like. In your bulletin, there's a flyer. I think probably most of yours are blue, but there's a flyer in the bulletin. And, and maybe in some bulletins, there's a couple of them. And there was two in my bulletin when I picked it up earlier this week. Um, this is a way for you to invite others to come to Awana. So if you have, obviously if you have children, we want you to bring them to Awana um, on Wednesday nights. But if you have grandkids, if you have family members, nieces, nephews, um, if you have neighbors, children around you uh, somewhere, some way, we want to encourage you to use that flyer to uh, just make them aware of our children's Awana clubs. That would be a blessing. And then uh, finally, let me mention... Uh, that our son Hudson, the reason that I was out of town was to help get him settled in his new home and job and those sorts of things. Um, he is settled in there uh, in Washington, D.C. and is leading worship this morning at Pillar Church. Thank you for your prayers and encouragement to him and for us as we traveled. Um, he has a, a sign-up list for an email um, update if you would like to receive those. This one's already full, but there's a blank one on the literature table. If you haven't given your name and email address for those updates, there's kind of just one more week to fill that information in on the sign-up sheet on the information table. Well, this is the Lord's Day, and it is our great privilege and responsibility on this day to worship Jesus Christ as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you would, please bow your heads with me. And let's seek the Lord together in prayer. I want to give you an opportunity to pause and reflect. Ask the Lord during this time to help you uh, give your heart and your attention to him. And then in a moment, I will open our service in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful that this is the Lord's Day and that we are called on this day to give to you our worship, our attention. We focus on prayer and your word in a particular and in a corporate way. And I pray, O oh God, that we together here would encourage one another as we lift up our voices to sing your praises and to honor your name. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you would, please stand with me and turn your attention to the screen. We're going to read uh, a passage of scripture speaking of the power of the gospel. We'll read Romans 1, 16 to 17. If you would please read aloud with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Please remain standing as the worship team comes and leads us. Um, Lift up your voice and your countenance to the Lord. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. My Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission of his delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Sing that again. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. You may be seated. Morning. Uh, First, I'd like to mention you'll have your opportunity to worship the Lord through giving by placing your offerings in the uh, offering plates or in the back, or you can go online at cbcdemont.com and present your offering there, or just put it in the U.S. mail. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah chapter 6. You know, this is probably one of those pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. I believe Isaiah probably saw Jesus on his throne the reason I say that is if you look later, not now, in the Gospel of John in chapter 12, verse 41, I think John alludes to this event. And it's hard not to, uh, it's hard not to miss Isaiah's excitement at what he saw when we read this. So it's from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. 
for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and that you came willingly and laid down your life for us. And you have atoned us. You have redeemed us. You are our redeemer. Lord Jesus, as we gather together on this Lord's Day, we pray that all the things that we do here, um, the singing that we do and the praise that we offer and the offerings that we have and the scripture that we read and the word that is preached and all those things would bring glory and honor to your name. May our hearts be attentive to your word as the seed of your word is planted in our hearts. Lord, we know that you are causing us to grow and you are conforming us to the image of Christ. And Lord, we just pray for your blessing on our time together. And we pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. uh, Let's sing to the Lord again.
my Jesus, I love thee. seated. Well, thank you to our worship team for leading us, and um, boys and girls, second grade and down, you can be dismissed to go to your class at this time. And for the rest of us, as we begin our time in the Word of God this morning, I want to just encourage you to make sure that you have an outline from the bulletin. So if, if you kind of missed out on the bulletin as you were coming in, uh, now would be a great time to step out into the foyer and grab one so that you can have uh, notes to follow along with the message this morning. So the top of the notes say the assurance of salvation. And the first several passages of scripture that we're going to look at plus an extended quote are already printed out there in those notes. And that way we won't be qu flipping quite as much through our Bibles. You will probably want to turn in your Bibles eventually to John chapter 6. So if we're all kind of getting settled and have our Bibles ready to go and copies of the notes there, maybe I'll begin by saying a couple of things about doubt, maybe even in our day and age, the idea of extreme doubt, kind of verses in our day and age 
something that we might refer to as overconfidence or false confidence. So it does seem like to me in my own uh, lifetime in recent years that both the idea of false confidence and extreme doubt have, have kind of been elevated in our society. Um, so conspiracy theories would be one example. You can believe almost anything that you want to with no evidence whatsoever, but if you shout it loud enough, you will gain a following. So recently, I uh, was made aware of a person who is a flat earther, right? And uh, there are some celebrities that are flat earthers, right? And there seems to be just an incredible amount of evidence that the earth is round, right? Or that it's a globe. But there are people who firmly believe that the earth is flat and they're doing everything that they can to convince you that it is so, right? Despite all of the evidence to the contrary. Um, and at the same time, at the same time, there are many examples in our world of extreme doubt. So an example of extreme doubt might be some of the gender confusion that is in our world and increasing all around us. So some people are starting to say that when doctors, right, qualified medical doctors fill out birth certificates, that they are actually only guessing when they write down a baby's sex or their gender. When they fill in that one blank, that they are only guessing. But somehow, somehow, with all the literal, physical, right, evidence to the contrary, some people in our society think that that's very insightful to say such things. So it seems like we have extreme examples in our um, society of false confidence, false overconfidence, and extreme doubt at the same time. And in some ways, and, and in different ways, of course, both of these seem to be elevated and respected. And what is not honored in our society very often is a degree of humble confidence where someone might say you know I don't know everything about this but I've actually spent my life studying it we just kind of ignore what people like that <laughs> say in our society but when it comes to spiritual matters when it comes to spiritual matters there is one specific example where these two things can be absolutely spiritually deadly. Extreme doubt in this arena is paralyzing, and false confidence is eternally damning. And that is the arena of the assurance of our personal salvation. The assurance of salvation. So, this is so eternally important that I'd like for us to bow for a moment and pray and ask God to speak to our hearts through his word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, your word is so powerfully clear when it teaches us the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, your son coming to the earth to die in our place for our sins and for our salvation. The offer of forgiveness and reconciliation is free and full, and yet some put their faith in the wrong thing for the security of their eternity. And so, Lord, I pray that this would be both a convicting and a comforting message for us. And I pray, O oh God, that, that this, these passages of Scripture would open up and expose the truth and reality of our own soul and our own spiritual condition. And, Lord, may it be that this would um, convict unbelievers that may have made a false profession of faith. It would stop any in their tracks who need to reevaluate the condition of their own soul. And at the same time, Lord, I pray that it would comfort and encourage and spur 
on true believers to Christian growth and service, Lord, we pray, in confidence and in peace of the Holy Spirit. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to begin this morning with a few preliminary thoughts about this topic of the assurance of salvation. And then there's an outline, a three-point outline, one, two, three, with some blanks for you to fill in. Really all that is is a trick for me to try to preach two sermons in one morning. So let's start with these preliminary thoughts. What is the doctrine of assurance? What is the doctrine of assurance? So I'm going to simply read what is printed there. This is a quotation from a very godly, wise pastor and theologian named Sinclair Ferguson. And here is what he writes on the definition of the doctrine of assurance. Assurance is the conscious confidence that we are in a right relationship with God through Christ. It is the confidence that we have been justified and accepted by God in Christ, regenerated or made alive by His Spirit and adopted into His family. And that through faith in Him we will also be kept For the day when our justification and our adoption are consummated in the regeneration of all things, or in other words, in the new heavens and the new earth, in the future expression of God's kingdom. So let me just unpack that a little bit. We haven't got time to sort of repeat and expound on everything that he says right now. We'll do that really throughout the sermon. But of course, a right relationship with God is only available in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So You're not right with God. You don't have a right relationship with God because you're a good person, because you do good deeds or your good works add up to outweigh your bad deeds or your sins. None of that. The right relationship that we want to have confidence about is not about ourselves and our own performance. It is in Christ Jesus or through Christ. But there is this element of confidence. In fact, it is a conscious confidence. So it's not something like you're saved, but you can't really know it until you die and go into eternity. No, there is a conscious, present confidence available to believers that we can be right with God through Christ Jesus. This confidence has to do with being justified. In other words, being made right with God, that our sins have been forgiven and we have been granted the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It has to do with regeneration. It has to do with the Holy Spirit, both making us new, giving us new hearts, and indwelling us so that we literally are new people in God. And also confidence that we have been adopted into God's family, that we are actually the sons and daughters of God. This confidence has to do with justification and regeneration and adoption. But again, this is through faith, faith in Him, faith in Him. And also this confidence goes along the way of that we will be kept by God, that God is going to finish the work that He has begun, that there is not some possibility that if having truly believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and been justified and adopted into His family, that somehow we will fall out of His family. So that is assurance, is this expansive spiritual confidence in God's work being real now and ultimately growing and completed in eternity. It's confidence about what God has done in me and what he has or will do for me in the future and in eternity. Now, Um, God wants Christians to have this confidence. God wants believers to have the assurance of salvation. So I believe you have printed there in your text or in your notes, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 13. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 13. It says this, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now we're going to read another passage from 1 John later in the uh, sermon, but fairly often in the epistle of 1 John, we find these phrases, so that you might know something, so that we might know that our sins have been forgiven, so that we might know that we are a child of God, and, and several other times that that is mentioned. We're going to read one of them a little bit later again in the message. But 
um, really in this verse, he's referring to the entire book. He's, he's referring back. It's, he's starting the conclusion of the book in verse number 13. And he's saying, I've written these things, all of these things in the entire letter from chapter 1 on. I've written all of these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So if God wrote basically an entire book of the Bible, five chapters, the epistle that we call 1 John, if he wrote that, the entire thing, so that we could know that we have eternal life, then, my friends, it's important. And it's something that God wants us to experience. It's something that God wants His people. He addresses it. He addresses it comprehensively. He dedicates an entire book of the Bible to it and plenty of other passages as well. Then, it's something that God wants us to have. He wants us to know that we are His. He wants us to know that we have eternal life and that we have those who believe in the name of the Son of God have eternal life. This is something that God wants for us. Now, some denominations today believe and teach that you really cannot have, that you can have salvation, but you can't have the conscious confidence that you possess salvation, that you are His, that they either teach this because they are teaching salvation by works, Salvation by works, and that would be the Catholic tradition, primarily. Or they are teaching some form of perfectionism, and that would primarily be the Wesleyan tradition, sometimes referred to as the holiness tradition. But again, again, some, despite what others may say, according to the Bible, people can know that if they believe upon the Son of God... They have eternal life. Some people, and I think that the reason these denominations teach what I believe to be false regarding assurance of salvation, that either you, can't, you, you can have salvation but you can't know it, or that you might lose your salvation, um, the reason that they teach this in some sense is because they believe that it is pride, that it is arrogant, to think that you can know for sure, and you know that you know that you're saved and that you have eternal life. But I would say that humility and confidence can coexist. Humility and confidence can coexist because what we're trusting is, is not so much the evidence of our own life, right? The evidence of my salvation goes up and down, and so does yours, right? It does go up and down, we're, we want to observe evidence. We want to know that it's there. But nevertheless, what we're trusting in is in the Word of God, in His revelation, in what He has said. So if our humble trust is in God's Word, then we can believe that God wants us to have the assurance of our salvation and the confidence and the peace that comes with it. In fact, God's, the application here would simply be that the purposes of God in promising salvation in such a powerful and secure and foundational way, the assurance of eternal life is he wants to provide believers with peace in their hearts so that they can go on and grow spiritually and confidence in their hearts so that they can move on and serve in the kingdom of God. They can speak the truth to others and encourage others. So God wants us to have peace so that we can grow, and confidence so that we can speak and serve on His behalf in the world. In fact, God actually commands us to confirm our salvation. The old King James translation of this is almost personally preferable for this, where in 2 Peter chapter 1, um, the author says, Peter says, to make your calling and election sure. So let me just read to you, I believe that the passage is printed there for you in your notes. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5. And, well, we're going to start reading in verse number 5, and then we'll get down to the portion that I just quoted in a moment. So he's talking about um, building on your salvation or building on your faith. Verse number 5, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. And then there's this kind of extensive list. 
and supplement your virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, so he's talking about spiritual growth in these character issues, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things or these qualities, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And so here, this is not just God wants you to experience confirmation of your salvation when he says confirm your calling and election or the King James make your calling and election sure um, he wants he wants us to pursue he says be diligent to confirm your salvation and the way that you confirm your salvation is by seeing growth in these areas adding to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge and knowledge self-control and so on all the way to love brotherly love and affection and so um, he starts with the foundation of faith, right? We are we're not saved by virtue. We're not saved by brotherly affection. We are not saved by love. We are saved by faith in Christ. We are justified by grace through faith. But he builds upon that, and we are called upon to confirm our salvation, our calling by the Spirit of God, our election in eternity past, by seeing these Christian qualities grow in us. So, part of Christian assurance is Christian character. Or maybe we could say there should be no Christian assurance of our salvation without Christian character. And God calls us to be diligent to pursue this Christian character. Now, we're going to circle back to that a little bit later in the message this idea of the evidence of our character and our obedience. Finally, in these preliminary thoughts is the Holy Spirit ultimately provides assurance. The Holy Spirit ultimately provides assurance. So Romans chapter 8, verse number 16, this says that the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. The Spirit of God bears witness. So this is internal and subjective, right? This is internal work of the Holy Spirit that, that confirms in our spirit, in our in eternal thoughts and being and heart that we are the children of God. Now, I'm only mentioning this now because of two things. First of all, everything that we're about to talk about, the evidence of salvation or the foundations upon which we build Christian assurance, the promises and power of God, the work of Christ, and our own evidence of obedience in our hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit uses those things. So this is the transition to the next miniature sermon in this sermon here on Sunday morning, right? The Holy Spirit uses those things that we're about to talk about to bring that confirmation to us that we are the children of God. I also am mentioning it now because that verse in and of itself could be its own message. It could be its own sermon. But starting sometime in September, I'm going to go back to our series on Romans, and we're starting in Romans chapter 8. So we'll get a full explanation of that passage and the others surrounding it um, when we come to that. But we do need to remember that bottom line, assurance of our salvation is ultimately a work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the foundation of Christian assurance of salvation. So what is it? Pastor, what is it that should bring to us this assurance that we are the children of God? What is it that the Holy Spirit will use to direct our hearts to believe and to know that we know that we belong to Him, that our sins have been forgiven, our souls have been saved, and our eternity is secure, and we are the children of God? What is that? And so that foundation what is it that the Holy Spirit uses are these things that I have listed here. Um, first of all, number one, the power and promises of God. The foundation of Christian assurance regarding our own salvation is the power and the promises of God. 
So I want us to look at a couple of passages in the book of John for this one, for this point. So please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We'll look at a passage here and then another passage in John chapter 10. In John chapter 6, Jesus has um, fed the 5,000. He's actually um, walked on water. And then he gives this discourse that we refer to as the bread of life discourse. And there's crowds that are around him. And some of these crowds are starting to get uncomfortable with some of the things that Jesus is saying. He's talking about an extreme level of trust and a high level of commitment in him and to him. And so some of these crowds are kind of falling away. By the end of the chapter, it's just the disciples left around, the 12 disciples. But this is what Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse number 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. This is, this is powerful reality going on here. This is talking about the sovereign work of God giving a bride to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is eternal. This is God the Father working sovereignly. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And then, listen to this, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. You ask, well, who is it that the Father is giving to Jesus as his bride? Well, it's whoever comes to him. That's who it is. And he says, I will never cast cast them out. Think about how sweet and meaningful those words must have been to Peter after he had denied Christ and wept those bitter tears. Think about that. He knew, he knew in his heart that he had come to Christ and he knew that ever how long it was that he was going to sort of backslide in his fear and anxiety and denials of Christ, he knew in his heart that he would have to go back to Jesus. There was nothing else in life for him but Jesus. And so how sweet this must have been that if he had come to Christ and he was headed back to Christ as evidence that his coming to him was the real thing to begin with, and Jesus would not cast him out. Jesus would not cast him out. And so we see the security of the believer in Jesus will not cast them out. Then turn over to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, starting in verse number 27. John 10, 27. These beautiful words about Jesus being the shepherd, us being the sheep, and Jesus keeping us and us never perishing. So look at John chapter 10, verse number 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the Son and the Father are one in their holding securely of those who come to Christ and who believe in Him and who have received eternal life and who will never perish. So maybe just the thing that we should say is simply this. The experience of Christian assurance... It, and it is a subject of experience, right? Our doubts may go up and down. Our confidence may go up and down. But the experience of Christian assurance is built on the security or the doctrine of the security of the believer. The security of the saved, the security of the believer, is not based on our spiritual strength. It is based upon the power of God's eternal grip. God's powerful claiming of us as his own. Listen to what the Puritan pastor and author Thomas Watson said. It is not your holding God, but his holding us that preserves us. When a boat is tied to a rock, it is secure. So when we are fast tied to the rock of ages, we are impregnable. And so, do you understand that analogy? You and I are little 
wobbly John boats, okay, on the waves of a tsunami, right? Our own sinful nature remains in our hearts. The world tempts us severely. Our minds are filled with doubts. We are like little John boats on a tsunami, my friends, but we are tied to the rock of Christ if we are believers in him, if we are his, if we are held in his hand. Our security is not us and our little rowboat, right? We would be sunk if that was us, our spiritual rowboat, our spiritual oars and our ability. You might be able to row faster than me, but it's not going to help you, right, in a tsunami. But if you're tied to Christ, if you're tied to him, whatever the spiritual weather is around you, you are secure. We are tied to an infinitely secure rock. So the foundation of Christian assurance is the power and the promises of God that no one can snatch us out of his hand. Number two, the foundation of Christian assurance of salvation is the atoning work of Christ. The atoning work of Christ. And for this, I want us to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 5. <clears throat> so the foundation of Christian assurance of our salvation is the atoning work of Christ. And so we could, we could read a whole section of the Romans chapter 5, we actually could read any number of passages from the book of Romans itself, but I, I simply want to point out one primary point from Romans 5, verse number 8. For God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let me read that again. God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then he goes on, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For, verse number 10, While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Much more now shall we, that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And so, obviously, he's talking about salvation. He mentions being saved or salvation a number of different times in that passage. And it is built upon two things in verse number 8. God's love and Christ's death. God's love, God's redeeming love, and Christ's atoning death. And I simply want to point out that both of those things are things that are completely outside of you and completely outside of of your own experience. Jesus died on Calvary at a specific time in history, on a specific place on the earth. It is a historical, literal reality that God showed his love to us in Christ's death. You can't change that reality. It is both eternal and it is something that happened completely at a different time and place than you have even lived. Right? It's, it's just a historical reality and an eternal, steady reality in the heart of God. And those things are completely outside of you in your experience. No matter how much you sin, you can't change those things. No matter how much you doubt, you can't change these things. And it is from these things that we are justified by His blood. It says, there in verse number 9, in other words, we're made spiritually, legally right with God. It says that this is based, based on these things. We are reconciled to God. In other words, relationally, we are right with God. And we have, that is what our salvation is. We are both made right in the righteousness of Christ, and we are made sons and daughters relationally to God. Now, number three, not only is the foundation of Christian assurance the power and promises of God and the atoning work of Christ, there also is, number three, the evidence of a life of obedience. The evidence of a life of obedience. So turn with me back to the book of 1 John, chapter 2. A life of obedience. So 
So the security of our salvation is in the grip and power of God, the power and promises of God. That is given to us specifically and individually through the atoning work of Christ, but there will be fruit. There will be evidence that God's work is being done in us and that he has forgiven our sins and he has made us new. There will be evidence of a changed heart and a changed life. So I want us to take a look at 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse number 2. He, referring to Jesus Christ, he is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means atoning sacrifice. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him. Did you see that? Another one of those phrases, we know that we have come to know him. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So listen to me very carefully. There's a little progression in this paragraph. And first of all, he starts off in verse number two with this idea, this kind of big theological word called propitiation, which simply means the um, atoning sacrifice for our sins. The atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so listen to me carefully. He starts again in this passage, even before he gets to the evidence of salvation, he goes back to the foundation of salvation. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for us. This evidence is not purchasing salvation for us. This obedience is not gaining salvation. That is found in the atoning work of Christ. But nevertheless, there will be evidence of that atonement. There will be evidence of that salvation. And that's what he says encapsulated in verse number three. By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. So he, that is subjective, right? We do not keep those commandments perfectly. We don't keep them perfectly, but we certainly seek to follow the commands of Christ. Here's the way John Stott explains that, and then I'm also going to quote from John Calvin. So John Stott says, No religious experience is valid if it does not have moral consequences. So, in other words, keeping the commands of Christ, following in his calling and commands. That if we know Jesus, if we fellowship with him, if he is our Savior, if we know him as Lord and Savior, then there will be obedience. We will keep his commands. In fact, this phrase, keep his commandments, is uh, not just sort of know them mentally and also not just sort of do them outwardly, but a observant obedience, a watchful, observant obedience to Christ's commands. Also, I do need to say that this is not perfection, right? Some people especially read 2 John chapter 2 and teach a perfectionism. This is not perfectionism. This obedience will not be perfect. John Calvin said that this is referring to this, if we keep his commandments, is referring to those who strive, diligently work, right, to the capacity of their human infirmity to form their life in obedience to God. So we still have a sin nature. We still will be tempted and will fail. But nevertheless, we will seek to form our lives in obedience to God. Sinclair Ferguson again said this, low levels of obedience are incompatible with high levels of assurance. So sometimes people really serve the Lord, seek to obey Him, and they feel like they're not worthy to have confidence in their salvation. No, they are the ones who should have confidence in their salvation. Then other people just kind of live any which way they want to, but because they walked an aisle, prayed a prayer when they were young, think that they're right with God, and they have very little obedience, if any, in their hearts to God and in their lives. So low levels of obedience are incompatible with high levels of confidence and assurance in salvation. By the way, children, young people, 
It is natural, adults, it is natural to have doubts about our salvation. It is, it happens. The longer you live, hopefully the more confident you will be because you will have seen God's promises through the years fulfilled in your heart and on your behalf. So there should be growing confidence. But let me say this to any and all of us. Christian growth, spiritual seriousness, Christian growth, growth in character, growth in faith, growth in grace is the primary antidote to doubts. You can get into a sort of cycle of spiritual navel-gazing, right? And am I really a Christian? Am I not really a Christian? The answer to that is walk with God. Believe His promises. Trust in Christ. Follow Him. And your confidence and your assurance will grow. Let me close with two final applications. These truths come with two things. A serious warning and sweet comfort. A serious warning and sweet comfort. I am going to have us turn to one final passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 7. So these, these truths regarding Christian assurance, they come with a serious warning. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse number 15, Jesus actually speaks about false prophets, but I want to say that the core, the kernel of this next paragraph is repeated again in Luke chapter 6, and it is not spoken about false prophets. It's actually spoken about everybody. So what he says here is not just applicable to false prophets, it's applicable to everyone. Verse number 15, Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false, false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy, and here we go, every healthy tree, not just those who teach or false prophets or good teachers, either one, Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Again, applicable to everyone, verse number 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. If you skip down to verse in verse 20 and 21, he talks about those who claim, Lord, Lord, uh, they, they claim Jesus' name. Let's just read verse 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, the one who obeys. Same thing as 1 John chapter 2. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus is talking about the very real possibility of someone making a false profession of faith that is not backed up by a changed life and deep, real, authentic, changed character. It is spoken, this context is spoken to and about people who are trusting in their outward good works, which, by the way, were kind of dramatic, right? Prophesying in his name, casting out demons in his name, and doing many mighty works. That's those were specific things that seem to have happened primarily during the days of Jesus and the apostles. We are never commanded to prophesy, cast out demons, or to do many mighty works in the name of Jesus. However, we are t told to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are told to serve. We are told to give. We are told to bear one another's burdens. We are told to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And so these are folks that are doing these outward kinds of things, but it does not correlate with their hearts, which are rebellious against God. And they are using these outward kind of dramatic works to mask the pride and rebellion of their hearts when their private actions don't stack up with their religious claims. And this is a stark, stark warning. Because Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. There is an element in which all of us need to have evidence of the reality of our hearts being changed. A soft heart and an obedient life. Growing character and growing service and obedience to God. 
that needs to be real for us or we are ignoring Jesus himself. The last thing I want is for one of my church people to hear Jesus say, depart from me, I never knew you. Children, young people, adults, senior adults, are you basing your assurance on the promises and power of God, on the work of Christ, and are you seeing evidence of that work being done in you? These truths also come with sweet, sweet comfort. What did we start out with in John chapter 6? Jesus said, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and those who come to me I will never cast out. That is powerful. That is reassuring that if we have come to Christ and he has begun his good work in us, he will complete it. He will not cast us out. We may stumble and fall, but even our stumblings God can use to give us greater resolve to follow him in the future. What comfort and what peace and what confidence that brings. My friends, today, like all times in history, Christians need peace in our hearts and confidence in this world. And that doesn't come from some kind of brash overconfidence, false confidence. That comes from knowing where we stand with God. Do you have that peace? And do you have that confidence? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask that you would help us. Help us, O oh God, to examine our hearts and lives, our everyday Monday through Friday, Sunday through Saturday, activities and lives. Is there evidence in our daily commitments, in our daily uh, obligations, in our daily work, is there evidence that we belong to you, that we have come to you, that we have followed you, that we have trusted in you, and you have made us new. O oh Lord, may it be that we would have that great Christian confidence that is tied to the rock that is higher than us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I wonder if you would please stand with me as we conclude our uh, message this morning. And we're going to sing together, His mercy is more. Though our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. That is where our confidence lies. Let's sing together. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
years of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. This morning, uh, I want to, as always, be available. If there's something on your heart that you would like to talk or pray with me about, then uh, I would love to be available after the service this morning to speak to me as you leave, or we can set up a time during the week. And I do want to say that God intends for us to have this confidence in our salvation in Him, in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you are experiencing doubts and you would like to talk to me about that, I would be thrilled to walk through the scriptures with you in addition to what we've talked about this morning and uh, walk through those things and pray with those things with you. Go in the grace of the Lord. You're dismissed.